that waiting season, I do look like a fool and I don't look like a good leader. And it has been humbling to to say, I don't know when my team, their jobs depend on it and their future depends on my vision. Jenny, welcome to the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. It's good to be here, Craig. Hey, it is great to have you on. I, I have an army of people <laughs> who've been telling me now forever, you have to have Jenny Allen on the podcast. So oh. I, uh, they have demanded <laughs> and uh, you have answered, so we're oh, glad to have you on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You're making such a big difference around the world. You um, have impacted, I would say, millions of leaders and um, have perhaps the um, maybe the biggest conference for women, at least that I know of, the uh, New York Times bestselling author, and really just a, a leader that we all can look up to. I'm curious, was there a time in your life when you first realized that you actually could be a leader? Maybe before you didn't think of it, and but yeah. you have a story of a time you realized, my goodness, I can be a leader. Well, you know, as a woman growing up in the 80s, early 90s, I, I didn't see a ton of women in the church mm-hmm. leading. Mm-hmm not in my part of the church. And so when I look back at that season, I fell in love with God when I was a junior in high school. And I came home and I just wanted to talk about him. I just loved him and I wanted to talk about him. So I started doing that and I annoyed the heck out of my friends. And so I gathered a little room of girls and I started teaching my Bible, but Beth Moore wasn't on the scene. There there weren't examples of that for me. I just had to do it. And I remember being in a class setting at like a Sunday school type class and, and I was sharing something and an older gentleman was in the room and he, he, I remember this so well, he pulled me aside and said, Hey, you have a gift of teaching. And that was the first time it even occurred to me that that was a gift, that that was something that I might have. Even though I was doing it, I didn't think of myself. I just didn't have a category for women teaching their Bibles. And so that was the beginning. And, and when I look back at my childhood, even before I was saved, I was a, I was an initiator. I mean, I was the one making the lemonade stand outside. I was the one creating the little play that we all participated in, you know, on the street for fun. Like I was the, the director per se. And so I think I always knew I had a lot in me. But as a woman at that stage of the church, it's very different today. I just didn't know what to do with it. Right. So it's interesting that you said that first you, you, you had maybe some natural gifts, but you weren't very good at it. Is what, oh, for sure. Is what you said. Yeah. What did you do in the early season of your leadership to improve? Well, the first thing I did was I got trained. So I learned my Bible. I went to seminary and I that was a priority to me. Once I realized and really owned that this would be a part of my story in my life, I never dreamed it would be on podcasts like this. I never dreamed it would be on the stage that I am on right now, but I'm glad I got trained. And I really did that because I wanted to steward my my gift well. I didn't want to lead people astray. And so that was a value to me. And then it was just, honestly, it was just doing it and asking for feedback and not being afraid to to look the fool, right? I mean, there were lots of times that I I probably humiliated myself. I, I used terrible metaphors or props or like, it was just, it was just bad. And I remember coming to one Bible study that I was teaching and wearing a wedding dress. I mean, it was just drama. And I, I don't even know. They were like, now how did that tie in? I mean, it was just terrible. So I definitely had to work at this. And, and I really believe it's the grace to, to start small. I was so blessed to be able to start in living rooms and to, grow into where I am today, although it took a really big leap um, once I was in public ministry. It, I, God gave me 15 years in small environments to hone my gift of teaching right, and leadership. Yes. So I'm, glad, I'm actually glad you said teaching and leadership because it almost sounds like you're kind of making them one thing. And in some ways, teaching is leadership. Yes. And in other ways, leadership is different than teaching. And I wonder, because you're actually very good at both. You're mm-hmm. a phenomenal teacher. And I think, based on this conversation alone, you probably think you're a better teacher because that's what people know you for. Right. But I actually see you as a world-class leader because teachers teach, but leaders build. And yeah. you've built an organization that is touching people around the world. So mm-hmm. it's not just content communication, but it's yeah. leadership. Can you tell me how you see where does teaching and leadership overlap and where are they actually separate things? That's such an interesting question. In fact, I'm so inspired even by this conversation because I have never parsed that apart, but I know 
that it comes from the same place in me. I want to see people know God. I want to see people whole and healthy and thriving. And sometimes the best way for that to happen is to put them in a room where they're with other people that that they share their guts out and I'm leading a conversation through if gathering. And sometimes it's through uh, communicating through a book and sometimes it's a podcast. You know, I, I feel like they're all mediums that I use, but the heart behind it is all the same. So for me, when you say it's all leadership, I really believe it's all leadership. I don't see myself really as a teacher or a writer. I see myself as a disciple maker, that that's what I'm trying to do through every genre. And and so the goal's all the same and the method and the means might be different. But I have learned a lot about leadership, leading an organization this big. I didn't mean for it to be this big. It, it started and it blew up really fast. And I had to learn to lead in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. And that was really difficult mm-hmm. and embarrassing, honestly. Yeah, so tell me about it. What, yeah. wh- where were you finding yourself underprepared? Yeah. And how were you compensating for it when it was outgrowing yeah. your leadership development and you had to catch up to it? Oh, I mean, I remember the first year, I never dreamed past the first if, and yet we had you know hundreds of thousands of live streams and it just it reached the world. And so at the end, I remember I was backstage with Ann Voskamp. In fact, we were in front of the camera backstage and she said to me in front of everyone, what's next? And I had never thought of it. And I remember finishing and getting in the car and just crying with my husband because I thought, we just birthed a dragon. I have no idea. At that time, virtual conferences weren't really in existence. I didn't have a lot of people to reach out to and say, what do we do next and how do we do it? And so when I look back at that part of my life, I wish I could talk to that girl Mm -hmm. (laughs) 10 years ago and just hug her Mm -hmm. and say, it's going to be okay. And God is going to give you what you need. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't strategy at that point. Mm -hmm. It wasn't um, great ideas. Mm -hmm. It was survival. And it was just doing the best I could. Mm -hmm. And I think God, (laughs) in spite of probably at the beginning, which was poor leadership, certainly weak leadership, Mm He worked and he moved, and then I grew up along the way. But, but I it was it was hard. Yeah. Well, I I think I can only imagine someone listening to this right now, and that speaks directly to where they are. Yeah. Because maybe they were promoted before they feel ready, or maybe they started something that's got more traction than they expected, or maybe they started something and it's struggling and they don't yeah. know what they have what it takes to get there. And it's really amazing how you can learn along the way. Yeah. In fact, I think the best leaders do. And so I applaud you for that. And one thing I love about just the guests we have on this podcast is the variety of the types of leader. It's just expansive. And so I would love to hear if you could kind of self-assess, mm. do you have a style of leadership? Well, not afraid to admit that I don't know the answer to something. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. In in the last year or so, we've known there's a massive change happening in our organization. We couldn't quite quantify it, and we couldn't exactly say why, but we all knew it, that post-COVID, I think if you aren't changing and you aren't rethinking how you're doing it, then it's it's going to not connect. And so we knew that we just, we were in a season of change. But as the visionary, everyone was looking to me and asking, where are we going and what are we doing? And I didn't know. And I wasn't afraid to say, I don't know. And then one day I did. And I, I was, it was a dream. I was, it was, I woke up from it and I knew exactly where we were going. And I think that is, I don't know what type of style of leadership that is other than just desperately following Jesus. You know, I I don't feel like I always have the right strategy or the right answer, but if I'm patient and I wait, God is so clear. But that waiting season, I do look like a fool and I don't look like a good leader. And it has been humbling to to say, I don't know when my team, their jobs depend on it and their future depends on my vision. So hearing what you're saying, it sounds almost like a prophetic style of leadership yeah. that you really, you're going to pray and <laughs> it, it, either you go up the mountain, come back down with a vision or go to sleep and wake yeah. up after the dream. And that's been effective over time. I'm going to guess that the people on your team would probably describe you in some what I call feet on the ground ways. They'd say she's direct or they'd say she's got (laughs) systems or they say she's collaborative or they'd say she's empowering. What are some of the words Mm -hmm. that they would use to describe 
your, yeah. your, 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 what you do? Certainly not systems. They would laugh at that word okay. and me, um, but collaborative. Okay. I definitely depend on a lot of people. Mm-hmm. That is, is something I'm not embarrassed about. Mm-hmm. There's a army <laughs> pulling off the things we do and I'm so grateful for them. And so I think definitely a team, I would say a team leading or mobilizing visionary leader. So say that again. A team, team mobilizing visionary leader. Okay, a team mobilizing visionary leader. And the reason why I, I want to be just so dialed into this is because something you said is going to be really freeing to someone else. Mm-hmm. And that is systems are generally very, very important. <laughs> they are. But if you have a team That's right. mobilizing visionary <laughs> leader. Someone else can do that. Someone else can do that, right? That's right. And so that's kind of what I wanted to get at is you um, you really do have a pretty unique style mm-hmm. and you have a very effective and big outcome. And I, I'm wanting to give our community just permission to be different. That's right. Yes. And I think about the people up closest to me in ministry. Mm-hmm. They are so different than me, but we have all of this in common. They understand me as a leader that I'm waiting on God and there's grace mm-hmm. for that. Mm-hmm. And so it, I would say it's kind of organic uh, that even though we're leading this big thing, we're also trying to make decisions on the fly with wisdom and still be excellent. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask you a question that's going to sound weird coming from a pastor and you're going to be like, people are going, yeah, is that unspiritual? Is there ever a time where you haven't heard from God and you just have to make a decision? Oh yeah, okay. all the time. Mm-hmm. And I trust if if I'm in that position, he's just fine with whatever I mm-hmm. I say. Um, I Where I get itchy or just uncomfortable is if I, it's a huge risk mm-hmm. and then I'll just beg him. I mean, it's it's like me and God in the car, and I'm like, you need to clarify now. Like, I don't want to risk my friend's jobs. I don't want to risk the the good work he's done with what we're doing. So, so there are times I'm yelling at him and just going, please show me, like, show me. But there are lots of times it's not clear, and I just have to make a decision. So what is a risk that you've either taken recently or mm-hmm. you're considering taking that you're <laughs> able to tell us about? Well, there's a really big one coming, mm-hmm. and it's it's what I what I really believe is the future of of the ministry that God's entrusted us with. But I can't go into a lot of detail with it. But I can say that it is mobilizing way further than our organization, and we are bringing in and pulling in all different organizations and people. Mm-hmm. And it has been so rewarding, and it's been fun to see the. I mean, I'm just gonna it's gonna sound like I'm bragging, but. I think this would help people listening too. When I look back at the girl 10 years ago that was so scared to lead, so scared to to be in over her head, but she just was because she was following God. And I see myself today. It's different. And I think it's different, not because I trust myself more, but I've seen God show up. And, And he's grown me up, right? And so this time when I'm sharing a vision and I'm saying, this is what I know God's calling me to do, there's a different mood in the room. It's... And, and there's a different confidence in me. And it's not a confidence that could have been in that girl, I don't believe, 10 years ago. And so if somebody's listening and they feel like they're in the insecure spot, it's okay. And and I don't know that, I'm not saying that God is okay with insecurity because I think faith can grow in you in any situation. But I also think he's okay that it takes time. Mm-hmm. And he's it, we're all in process, right? And in, in this way, I have grown. And I'm a confident leader talking about a new vision totally differently than I did 10 years ago. And and it's exciting and, and beautiful. And I can't wait to share it with everybody. But but I, I really believe that those 10 years brought me to this point. Mm-hmm. And if it hadn't been hard, I don't think I would have trusted God. I think I would have been the leader that made my own decisions and said, this is what we should be doing. And this is this is what we're doing next because I have good ideas. And instead, I, I waited on the Lord and this idea really isn't mine. And I think that's why people get behind it is because they sense that. Yes. Yeah. They can feel the faith yeah. that you have and the passion. So it's interesting. You, you keep referring to yourself as that girl. And, you know, if I could talk to that girl and earlier on, you said that, when you were younger, you didn't necessarily in the church world have female yeah. spiritual leaders to look to. Thankfully, things are a lot better yes. today and there's more equal opportunities for gifts to be expressed. But I can imagine there's some people right now, some women that are in environments that they may not feel celeb- as celebrated in leadership. What advice would you give to them mm. to build their faith that they can make a really, really big difference? 
Well, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for you, Craig, really, because you have believed in me mm -hmm. and even just given me opportunities, and I appreciate that. And there are a lot of you're, pastors you're out easy, there. You're easy to believe in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there are a lot of pastors out there that do. And I, I just I want you to remember that because if you're listening, because there really are men that celebrate women. And I think we can get cynical or feel like that this is just the way men are. And that is not true. There have been so many men in my life, including my husband, that have just celebrated my gifts and and pushed me out the door to use them. And so I know that may not be everybody's experience. However, I would say that that wasn't always my experience. For many years, that wasn't my experience at all. And even my husband has come so far on just his view of this. And, and I would say in the years that that wasn't the case, God was still maturing me and preparing me for what was ahead. And I am so grateful that for 15 years, I just taught my Bible in my living room. And I made a lot of disciples that way. And so don't be discouraged. Whatever gifts you have, use them. In whatever context you in whatever context you can, because God will use those things and multiply it further than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So don't be discouraged and and just and don't use it as an excuse to not use your gifts because they're needed. And and we need you all to be making disciples in the world. We have a whole generation coming up that we both care about. Gen Z, we're watching them sprout up as zealots, right? So many of them love Jesus. We were just talking about your daughter that's 18 and, and my kids too. They love Jesus and and they need to be discipled and praise God for the people that have come along my kid, alongside of my kids in a one-on-one -on -one way and discipled them. Well, one of the things I appreciate about your writing, which is you're a fantastic writer, brilliant communica communicator, both verbally and written, and you're really transparent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I mean, you say things that just kind of like it is. Uh -huh. And I appreciate that you really openly share vulnerabilities and low times in your life. I'm, I'm curious, was there a massive leadership vulnerability mm. that was the most difficult for you to overcome? You know, I'll, I'll share a recent one, actually. I've been in counseling. Mm -hmm for kind of the early years of my ministry. I've, it's been primarily around work. Which is wise. Yes, I'm so grateful for it. And I've realized a lot of insecurity and fear that just is still part of my narrative today that was causing me to think about myself more than I wish I was thinking about myself. And that was truly the motivation. I didn't know if I could get rid of it, but if I could, I wanted to go face it and I wanted to I didn't want to walk into environments to minister to people like this minute mm -hmm. and in the back of my head have a running narrative that I don't belong here and that I shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And it really was kind of that way. And and I was just always um, using energy to push it back, right? And, and to try to just focus on what was in front of me and the people that God had called me to serve. And so I, I just, I was tired of it and I wanted to fight it. And it has been so hard to do that because it wasn't so much about the last 10 years, although certainly there have been some hard moments about that. It was about my 12-year-old self that realized, went from childhood to teenage years and realized I have to measure up, I have to, I have to perform, I have to hit the mark. And so what was an offering to God, which was my writing and my teaching and leading, became, am I hitting the mark? Did I hit the mark this time? And it, I just didn't want that anymore. And, and it's so cool, y'all. If you're listening to this and you think, I'm sick of that voice, and it, whatever the voice is saying to you, you know, of just in the back of your head that, that probably comes from your childhood. I mean, unfortunately, we have to go back there sometimes. There, there really is a, a way that God heals you from those things that you think you can never, they're just part of you, and they, they can't ever work themselves out. And for me, it was funny. My counselor said to me, you know, Jenny, after about a year of working through this, he said, now, you know, I, I wanted it to be over. And he said, now, Jenny, how long did it take you to get here? Right. <laughs> I was like, a few decades. <laughs> it's like, it's going to take you more than a month to yeah. get out of this, you know? So, yeah, I would say that's been one recently. Yeah, I think it's probably encouraging to some people right now because you, you, we do want, especially as leaders, we want quick fixes. Right. And sometimes we can't fix everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad because I feel like in this season where I've been working all this out, I have been so much closer to the Lord and in awe, really, of, of the story of my life and, and what He's been doing in it, even 
since I was young. So I'm kind of at this point in counseling. It's it's easier than it was in the beginning. I'm I'm enjoying the process. Good, good. Well, I'm going to talk more about the book, but I want to use this as a lead in the question. Uh, find your people, building deep community in a lonely world. I'm going to hold it up for those that are watching. And uh, page number one, you start <laughs> off and you talk about uh, having panic attacks. I'm, yeah. I, I'm reading it feeling uncomfortable just <laughs> for you, bearing your soul. Yeah. And as leaders, we don't get a vacation from leadership whenever we're going through difficult times. How do you do it? How do you uh, lead well when you're hurting I actually have a really clear answer to this question. You share it. Hmm. I have seen the freedom that has come in my leadership when I show up at the office and I tell everybody I am I'm in the midst of a really difficult season with a child or with myself (laughs) and I'm full of fear and I come in and say it's been a hard week and that has changed the tenor of our office. They share things now. I know there's a million ways that could go <laughs> to, you know, devolve into an emotional mess, but it doesn't. It's interesting because there's safety to just say, I don't know how to do this or I I need prayer right now. It, it, they've all embodied that as well. And I think it's gotten easier and lighter. I, I think about all that energy I spent trying to push that voice back. And when it's freed up, you know, you have more to give to other people. And so as I've gone saying what is hard and and sharing my weaknesses first has freed me. It has made me not feel like I have to be especially special. (laughs) I get to just be a human on this journey and bring people along. Secondly, it has freed other people because they see, okay, she loves God. She's running after him and she still Mm -hmm. has panic attacks sometimes. And, And that's... Comforting to the people that have panic attacks. No, it is. There's two quotes we say often here. One of them is that that you may impress people with your strengths, but Mm. you connect with them through your weaknesses. And you do that well. And then we always tell the leaders to really be yourself because people would rather follow a leader that's always real than one that's always right. I agree. So I want to ask you a little bit about that. With a quote from your book, and again, Find Your People is the name of the book. If you guys are driving, I don't want you to forget it. Go get it. You wrote this. You said, we live guarded because we fear someone will use our weakness weakness against us. Here's a question I have for you. Tell me, how how big is your team? Uh, We have about... 30 in total. 30 in total. So it still feels a little bit like family. Yeah. Okay. If it was 200 in total, yeah. would you be as equally vulnerable or does it change with size? Certainly, I, when it comes to things that are private, mm-hmm. I I share those with the right people. Mm-hmm. And, and what I mean by that is things that are in process and things that involve other humans. Because so much of what's difficult in our life, I can't ever share. Mm-hmm. Because it involves one of my kids, or it involves someone I love, and so I can't I can't share their hard. And so I would say certainly there are things that that do not go to even the, those thirty. However, there's always a way to share something that's real about what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And I have found the more I do that and look for opportunities to do that, whatever size the room, including, you know, huge events that I speak right. for, I, I really try to always just put down a card for the person that is in the back that thinks they're the only one. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I would say it's a different motivation. Mm-hmm. There are sometimes I need to be known and I need to heal from something, that is a small group of people. But there are times that I need to help people feel seen. And for that purpose, I would share and I'd share in a book that a lot of people buy. <laughs> right. So so there, it, it, interesting, it's, it's almost as if you're saying there's sometimes that you are a priority in healing as a leader, and there are other times where the people that you're leading right. are the sole priority. Yes. And if you're not a priority occasionally, then you can't make them yes. a priority often because you'll fall apart, right? Yeah. A quote that I liked in your book, you said, it was interesting, I kind of want to ask you about it. You said, the more resources a person gets, the more walls that he or she puts up, mm-hmm. and the more lonely they become. That, yeah. There's a lot in that. Can you unpack it for me? Well, that that thought actually came from a friend of ours who's a pastor in Rwanda, mm-hmm. and he currently lives in the States for, for a season. And 
he and I were talking and he said, Jenny, I feel sorry for you all. I feel sorry for you all because you can afford fences and alarms and you can afford to buy anything you need and you don't need each other. And gosh, that stuck with me. That was years ago. And I saw it and my son's from Rwanda. So we, we've we spent a lot of time in Rwanda and other countries in similar um, states. And I, I'm jealous of them every time I go because you go to a little village and outside of all the huts is a fire and a well and all of the women are washing their clothes together. All of the women are cooking together. All of the children are playing together. And that's how it's been for every generation until the Industrial Revolution. And even it is today in 80% of the world. So we are not more blessed. <laughs> we are more isolated. And the greatest need a human has in their brain, just physically, forget Christianity, forget um, emotions or, or all of that, just physically speaking, your body needs connection more than it needs anything else. In fact, it's the most um, likely reason that people are unhealthy <laughs> is that they're in isolation. And we're looking at a generation coming up with anxiety and yeah, they have what they need. Why are they, why? They're not at war. Why are they so anxious? They don't, they're not in the Great Depression. Why are they so anxious? These are kids that have everything they need. And yet they're, they're having panic attacks when they come home from school. Why? And I would say it's because of technology. We are living so disconnected from each other. So as a leader, do we need connection as much as other people? More? More. Okay. <laughs> do we typically get as much? More less. or less? Okay. <laughs> yes. So we, you would say we need more and you would say we get less. What's the answer? Well, I would say twofold. Number one, you need people that you don't lead in your life. So if you're a pastor, then you need friends that do not go to your church. You need to go learn a sport or jiu-jitsu. Yeah, Is that how you yeah, say it? Pretty close. We'll go with it. <laughs> you need to play golf. You need to find something, and you need to cultivate some relationships outside of that. Secondly, you need other leaders. I started a cohort. I didn't start it. One of my friends started it, but I've, I've been a part of it for the last two years. It's seven women and a spiritual director that that leads us. And it has changed my life to have other people that can say anything. It is a safe circle. Those the, What we say to each other does not go anywhere, but they understand and they're in it as well. Mm -hmm. I can imagine there's some leaders thinking like, who can I trust? Oh, and yeah. They feel a lot of weight. It's fair. What kind of practical steps would you suggest that they take to create some of those trusted, intimate relationships? Yes. So this is awkward, right? I mean, we all, and it is for everyone. I, I think leaders need to hear, it's not just you. I think it is awkward for everyone to make friends. And so what I encourage people to do is, is to look at the spheres of their life, whether it might be through your kids' sports, it might be someone that... Um, that you get to know from a club or, you know, my dad used to bowl and was in a bowling league. I, uh, there's a whole death of hobbies that, that has caused a lot of this disconnection as well. So whatever it is, just to find one person that, that you could go to coffee with and go to coffee and just share something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be, you know, the biggest sin of your life. Just share something, share something vulnerable and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And if it goes well, then hang out again and share a little more. <laughs> but it really is kind of like dating where you just have to try. And and if you get a bad reaction and they're like, gosh, and they they feel judgy, walk away. Don't don't stay there. <laughs> That's probably not your person. But 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 try it out. And it does take work and effort. But but I promise you, and it may take rejection and it may take five people just not working out. And I think everybody needs to hear that. That's normal. That's not crazy. It's not just you. You're not especially broken. I don't think. Now, some people need to pay for a friend. Like, that's what therapy's for, right? You pay for a friend to tell you the truth. Um, if you keep getting no's, then maybe you do. But but largely, it just takes a minute. And so that effort, though, if I told you at the end of five years, you would be incredibly close to two or three people, and they would be in your life for the next 10 to 15 to 30 years, would you do it? You would. But we doubt that it's possible. But it is. So would you recommend um, to a leader over department, uh, business owner, um, leader of a nonprofit, can they have an inner circle, very close friend that works for them? Yes, and I do. But that takes a lot of time and constantly revisiting the relationship and conversation to frame the friendship. Because we all have had people be in our lives for a season, and then the second that they aren't in that role anymore, they're out and they're gone. Mm -hmm. And and so I think just being really honest 
that that hey, this is this I view you as a friend first. I remember when my husband was a pastor, it was so hard because what we constantly sensed was the church came first. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, theologically maybe that's probably true, you know, for some relationships. So there were a few friends though that we just pulled aside and said, "Hey, will you just be our friends first? <laughs> just when something happens at the church, not be listening to how you can correct us. Like just just be with us in this ride." And but it took a lot of honest conversations and and really fighting for that. Mm-hmm. This is going to sound like a pretty obvious question I'm asking late in the conversation, but I do want to ask it. Uh, what's a why? Like to be effective as a leader, you got to be healthy. What do these intimate friendships? Mm. What, what are they doing? Everything. In our lives? Everything. Unpack Let it. me be even scientific for a second. Mm-hmm. I just saw this video, um, probably on you know reels or, or TikTok, and it was it was neuropathways trying to find themselves and reconnect. Mm-hmm. It was these two little, you know, parts of the brain that were finding each other and and reconnecting. And it blew my mind because they were working so hard. And what I know from all my research is that those pathways, the only way they heal from trauma is to not be alone in whatever trauma happened to you. So as we are going to quickly share our trauma in a safe way, um, the research says that and my friend, Kurt Thompson, Dr. Kurt Thompson, he uses this a lot, this research. He says, people crave to be safe, to be seen, to be soothed. And so people in your life doing that physically changes your brain. You heal. You want to know why you can't get over a sin pattern that you've struggled with for 10 years. You want to know why you can't seem to um, change behaviors that you've been struggling with for so long. It's because you're trying to do it by yourself. There is something, and I'm not just talking about accountability. I'm talking about truly being known. There's a reason you do that behavior. And it's it's a part of you that needs to feel seen, safe, and soothed. And I know this all sounds like counselor jargon, but it is it is human. And God knew it. I mean, the scriptures say it all everywhere. Mourn with those who mourn. You know, th- there's, a, there's this idea that when we are with each other in our struggle, that our brain heals yes. and we're free. Well, it, it is a little bit counselor jargon in the best way, meaning for us to be whole, healthy leaders, we have to work through stuff, yeah. like a lot of stuff. And if we're not, if we're not, if we're not healing on the inside, what do we, we tend to reproduce what we are. And if we're unhealthy, we tend to create more unhealthy cultures. And so this is super important. And this, man, I just, I wrote this down. Safe, seen, and soothed. I want you, I want to think about this in leadership today. How safe <laughs> does it feel to lead? Does it feel safe or do you feel vulnerable all the time? Oh, this is the best story. Okay. I've got it. I I feel safe. And it is because of the, these two years that I've invested with this crew. Mm-hmm. I told them the vision that I have and I did it with trembling. And they said, Jenny, no matter what happens mm-hmm. or what you face in the world, we're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. We're not leaving the room. And... And it's funny because I'm taking risks that involve a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And yet just having my inner circle secure mm-hmm. and see me mm-hmm. and be there for me gives me so much confidence because I can lose the world, mm-hmm. but I have my people. Right, <laughs> right. So it changes you. So it does. And I, by nature, though, I would say most leaders probably don't feel a lot of safety. Most leaders feel oh, no. vulnerable. They're going to feel attacked. They feel the weight of all this on them. And so you would say, and I think you've proven in just yeah. your research and in your own life, that a community adds a layer of safety. So without it, leaders are pretty vulnerable. And then seen, here's what's crazy, is most people think leaders are seen all the time because they're up front. But there's different types of being right. seen or being known. You can be known publicly, but not known privately. And you can feel very, very yes. alone in leadership. Right. And so does someone see mm-hmm. you? Mm-hmm. Not just what you produce, right. not just the not just the value you bring, um, not just what you create, but you. Mm-hmm. Do they see you? And then the soothe part, this, I kind of laugh at this. I tell Amy all the time, like, sometimes I just need people around us to listen yeah. to me and just kind of, can you just kind of hold me? You know, and I mean, <laughs> yes. I really do. Like, we I do. need, I need n- nurturing. Yeah. And because I, I feel like sometimes, you know, I'm on the battlefield, then I just want to come home and say, can you put a band aid on my boo boo? <laughs> you know, or just save people around. Yeah. And so I think I just want to I want to repeat what you're saying, because yes. I think there's more layers of brilliance behind this than 
what is obvious to some at first is that in, most leaders don't feel safe. Yeah. Most leaders don't feel seen and most leaders don't feel soothed. Yeah. And I think it's important to know you don't need to feel that everywhere to be whole. You just need to feel it somewhere. somewhere. Yes. Yes. And if you can build that, and you're going to have to intentionally build it, it's not going to come find you. That's exactly right. It's not going to find you. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to go build it. And I'm sorry, because that is hard and, and it's work and you're already be, working. You'll have to probably be hurt on the journey yeah. of building it. You'll probably yep. be disappointed on, on the journey of building <laughs> yep. it. And the getting to that place is worth the journey it's for sure. It. The name of the book is called Find Your People, Building Deep Community in a Lonely World. I, I, grateful for you writing that and your leadership. All right, just for a little fun, the uh, we'll call this the lightning round. I'll fire off a few questions. Do you have a favorite leadership quote? Yes. I don't know who said it. I, I'm, I'm drawn to think it was Andrew Murray, but don't make much of yourself. There you go. Serves me well. <laughs> don't make much of yourself. Is there a book that you've read recently or um, even the last year or two that stands out as something you recommend others read? I'll go with even just what's by my bed right now is the, they have a little prayer book, Every Moment Holy. I just never get tired of it. Mm. It's so simple and centering. Every Moment Holy? Every Moment Holy. Mm. And speaking back to the not making much of myself, it helps me do that. Mm -hmm. I like it. So when um, someone shows appreciation to you as a leader, they might write you a note, they might give you a high five, they might send you brownies or something, whatever. What, What is an expression of gratitude that means a lot to you? I love hearing their story. I love hearing how their life has changed. Is there a secret talent or gift or skill that you have that we would not know that you want to tell us about? I have many. One is I can make a monkey sound that sounds like you're in the jungle. I'm not going to do it on this podcast. Well, you can't. You can't. You can't bait us like that. My husband's Like, like, oh, no, don't do it. Yeah, I don't I know. Can't. I'll it's let so I'll let the crew in here vote with the like it. Like Everyone you got, it's got to be kind of loud. Yes loud. or no? Like what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I'll, okay, all right, all right. Yeah. Here's the deal. Just I'll step do back it, and y'all can cut bit. it out if right. it's too much. Okay. Ready? <laughs> I've done this in so long. kind of sounds like a dog. And the fact that you're proud of that is the funniest moment on this whole episode. So there you go. It is the, uh, it is the Jenny that Owl monkey voice. And that, that was actually pretty See? good. I used to do good. I used to do Tarzan when I was a kid. Yeah. Johnny Wise Miller. I think you should do it right now. No, but I actually know better. So. I know. I know. I'm ruined. My ministry's over. And uh, final lightning round question. Is there a, a most meaningful leadership moment that kind of comes to mind? Yeah, I I was speaking at Passion. This is one of my favorite moments of my life. And sweet Louis Giglio said, I, I was like, Louis, I think I'm supposed to ask people to confess their sin. And he said, go for it. And he did it. And I was so nervous because I thought, I don't know what'll happen in the room. We were in an arena of 60 plus thousand. And they all did it. And I asked at the end, this was Louie's idea. He said, have them stand up if, if they do so. And and it was just like the whole stadium stood up. And I'm, I will never forget it because it wasn't about like a successful moment in that moment. It was that God had said to do something scary. <laughs> and I did it. And I just felt like there was a reason. There were people in that room that needed yeah. to do that. Yeah, that, that is meaningful when you... And, hear, and you're and, nervous, and, you know? And you are nervous, and, and that's that's part of leadership, I yeah. think, right? Well, I want to just express my gratitude for you. I mean, I love you and your husband, Zach, are just world-class examples, and we applaud your ministry. Uh, the name of the book is Find Your People, Building Deep Community in a Lonely World. If um, maybe someone's just getting to know you through our community, how can they find out more about you? Everything is at JennyAllen.com, J-E-N-N-I-E-A-L-L-E-N.com. Very good. Well, thank you so much. And to our leadership community, thank you guys for sharing on social media. I love it when we see you out there. Uh, If this is helpful to you, uh, post about it. Tag Jenny, tag me, and our teams may repost you. And also, I want to encourage you to make sure you get the leader guide. Uh, We will put in that um, additional information and discussion questions for you to go over with your team. You can go to life.church slash leadership podcast. Also, if this content is helpful, it would be a gift to me if you rate it wherever you consume it or write a review, that'd make a big difference. And then in the spirit of what you've taught us, we're gonna tell them to be themselves because people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right.